Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich, and I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, DeKalb County Public Library, and the DeKalb Library Foundation, welcome to another in our continuing online events that we started in March due to the global pandemic. Tonight, of course, is one of our events in our On My Mind reading series that we developed with Read SC, the South Carolina Center for the Book. These programs highlight authors on the border of Georgia and South Carolina who are writing about those areas and about the South. If you would like to ask a question this evening after our presentation begins, you may do so by using the Q&A button that most of you will find at the top of your screen, depending on which device you have. And you can feel free to type that in and we will ask those to our presenter once the formal presentation is finished. I'd also like to remind everyone that you can buy books for tonight's events from Eagle Eye Books here in Decatur, Georgia. If you're not um, in the Atlanta area and are looking to buy books, we always encourage everyone to support your local independent bookstores, especially your black owned bookstores. They've done so much during this pandemic to bring books to people's doorsteps, offering um, online ordering, books by mail. They've just really done a great, great job in making sure that people who love books still get the books that they want to read. I'd also like to remind you that we will post a link tomorrow of the event in case you missed anything or would like to watch the replay. But right now I would like to turn it over to our guest this evening to talk about the Southern Wildlife Watcher Notes of Being a Naturalist. Rob Sinbeck's work has appeared in the Washington Post, Country Weekly, Field and Stream, and Guidepost, along with many other magazines and publications. He spent 25 years as a National Bureau Chief of Bob's King Lee's Country Top 40, and is an author, ghostwriter, and editor of over 20 books. He speaks at writers' conferences and universities across the country, and in addition to our event this evening, I hear that he has another event almost halfway across the United States tomorrow. So we are so pleased to have him join us for another of our On My Mind series. So will you please join me to welcome Rob Sinbeck. Rob? Thank you, Joe, very, very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Allie and Anderson. And thank you, the Georgia and South Carolina Centers for the Book um, and everyone like them who connects readers with writers. Um, being a writer is a two-part uh, profession. There is the time that you spend in front of the screen these days um, just putting on paper or putting into pixel form what's in your head uh, that you think uh, someone will be interested in. And then there's a part where you sit classically in a bookstore with people or in a, in a hall or a university classroom and share you know, the process and the books as they come out. This is, I think, my 25th event for this book, and it's the 24th that has been from my home, from my um, study. And uh, it's an odd thing. And the, um, as Joe was saying, it's when you've got events with people in, say, South Carolina, Georgia, and then in Arkansas, it's nice not to have to drive or fly between the two. It's nice to be able to do it from home. But I sure wish that we could sit together and I could I could see you all and and um, we could have the conversations afterwards. So uh, and thank you so much to the marvelous staff at the University of South Carolina Press, who put this book into existence. And um, I'd like to start a little bit with uh, the existence of the book, rather than talk the book itself just now. I'll get to it in a few minutes. But why it's uh, this is a book in the first place, and to do that, I have to go back with why I write about the outdoors. Um, because as Joe read, my um, resume is pretty wide. I wrote about religion for the Washington Post. I wrote uh, um, uh, stories of almost adventurous faith for guideposts. And for Field and Stream, I wrote about, um, it was actually about an owl hooter. Um, and so I've been all over the board. I've written about music a lot. Uh, and my life as a naturalist, which I really resisted that phrase when I was talking about the title of the book with the staff at the University of South Carolina Press. Um, they said, how about notes of a naturalist? And I said, I'm not a naturalist. I'm an assistant naturalist. Debbie is the naturalist. And they said, oh, but it sounds so good in the subtitle. So. Um, 
That's why it's there. I'm not claiming that designation. But Debbie and I started dating in 1987. And it didn't take me long to figure out that she knew every bird and tree and rock in the woods, what it was called, what it did, you know, how it nested, how it lived, how it grew. And as I followed her around, I started picking things up. I started learning. Um, and I had grown up in a small town or the outside of a small town in Pennsylvania. And so I'd spent a lot of time in the woods and the creeks. And I, you know, I knew a fair amount about the animals and, and plants, but I never studied the way you do when you're on a hike and just want to take in everything and absorb what you're looking at and what you're hearing and what you're smelling. And with Debbie, I could do that. She knew um, how to introduce the things to me that I didn't know, um, how to be a better birder, um, how to identify plants better. And um, so the first piece that I did after we started dating was called Notes from a Bird Watcher's Friend. And what it was, uh, was a, a tale with some humor to it about how I'd follow her around and what I didn't know and how I was learning. And I sent it to first, I think, the State Wildlife Magazine in Tennessee. But then I realized that state magazines, state wildlife magazines and conservation magazines don't compete with each other. The people in Wyoming don't buy Georgia's and the people in South Carolina don't buy Nebraska's. And so I sold that piece 12 different times. And I thought, hmm, let's hang on to this nature part of writing and let's hang on to Debbie. And so Debbie is still here. She's in the other room. And um, we've got 30, however many years that is now, since that uh, we first started walking around the woods in 1987. And um, so as a, a writer who wanted to make a living as a freelancer, I knew that I had to be as good a business person as I was a writer, or better actually. I consider myself an okay writer. I can, you know, I can um, make a subject reasonably interesting. I'm not the kind of classic storyteller that the South breeds. I'm not the one who can sit on the back porch and hold you spellbound with my tales of how, you know, Freddie and me as kids, um, uh, Freddie and I, of course. Um, as kids did you know put together a carburetor and and make it just a, a stem winder I don't do that but I can take and what I did with this book was to take all of the animals that are represented here and rack my brain for the encounters I'd had with them for the unusual facts about them and then I also brought in an expert for each one at least one expert and so I've got that balance between how they affect me, how they delight me, how they, you know, scare me, whatever, whatever the reaction is. Um, and then I've got the people who can nail down the natural histories. And that's the combination that this book um, does. And so with those state magazines, uh, I wrote for about 20 of them all together and then picked out the five that paid the best and just wrote for them and that was part of my business plan and i did that with all the areas that i write with because i wanted to be able to uh, make a living just doing this uh, it was a dream i'd had since i was 11 years old and it came true and i was really glad about that so i was writing for south carolina wildlife starting in 1994 and i hadn't been writing a couple months for it when linda renshaw who was the editor at the time said, I would like a column that just deals with one critter every issue and tells an interesting story and gets the natural history involved. And I thought, man, anytime I can get um, an article in every issue of a magazine, and it had happened for me in Tennessee when I was first starting out, I did a series on the Tennessee state symbols, the state bird tree, rock, song, all that stuff. And it turned into a book. My very first book was called uh, Tennessee State Symbols came out in 95. And, um, and so Linda said, I'd like that uh, column. So I did a sample or two. She said, yep, I think you've got the feel for it. And until this year, until earlier this year, I have been writing the column called Four Wildlife Watchers for South Carolina Wildlife Magazine. And in the meantime, 
I was writing other books. I did a history of the Nashville Symphony. I did a story about female pilots during World War II. It was a, a nonfiction book uh, about some incredible women. I started editing books with Methodist Publishing House. I started ghostwriting books for people like Cal Turner, who was a former CEO of Dollar General. So I had a really wide uh, career going. And I was also writing and doing interviews for Bob Kingsley, who counted down, as I said, the top 40 um, every week on 350 stations, whatever it was. And, um, but so much of my heart was in, um, the wildlife stuff that I did because it was, and, and this book turned out to be more of me as a person, as a human being, I think, than anything I've written. And so um, Bob Kingsley died about a year ago. Um, I, they got a new host and went on with it, but I retired uh, from there um, and decided I really want to do books going forward. I've got some things I've written through the years I'd like to see collected. And I'd been talking to the University of South Carolina Press about those columns because I knew it was a book. Uh, it just felt like a collection of those would interest uh, enough readers that the publisher would care. And sure enough, they did. And they've been so good to work with. Um, just putting together everything from the cover, which I think is gorgeous. Although um, Debbie calls that, um, she said, that fox is too scrawny. That fox is obviously not a great rabbit and squirrel hunter. And, uh, but people, most people really like the fox that's on the cover. And the hummingbird goes to a story that I'll, I'll tell in just a minute, uh, the chapter on, on Debbie. Um, but the book came out uh, August 28th. And um, it's, it's been a delight, the whole process, despite the fact that I'm, you know, I'm here at home and not with you personally. Um, as I said, the book is me. And so I feel like when I'm talking about this book and my relationship with the critters um, around us that I'm sharing with people who are potential readers, just a piece of myself. And most writing like this is just, hey, guess what I saw? I mean, that's what those articles uh, or if, if I was writing about the, the bobcat in an issue, it's, I want the best, hey, guess what I saw? Guess what I know about bobcats? Guess what we can talk about? And, um, and so there've been probably 150 of those pieces uh, over the, those 25 years. And so for this book, we um, came up with uh, 36. We figured that was about the right size. And the divisions are 12, creatures of the land, um, of the dirt, 12 of the air, um, birds and butterflies and moths and dragonflies, and then 12 of the water from bullfrogs to manatees, both fresh and salt water, anything that you could run across in the southeast, whether out your back door or going to the beach. Um, and it's it's not a field guide in the sense that um, it's laid out with, I mean, there, there is a photo of each uh, critter. There is a little section at the very end that has description, range and habitat, and viewing tips for the places where you're most likely to see them, times of day, seasons of the year. And it, it does have those things, but I really wanted this book to feel like a conversation between two friends of, about the things that we see. And I'm not an elitist when it comes to uh, animals. So this is not just, um, you know, white-tailed deer and uh, bear and bald eagle and things like that. There is also a chapter in here on the housefly and one on the earthworm. And most people don't realize that houseflies and most species, uh, several species of earthworms that are very common aren't native to here. They were not here when Europeans got to this continent. Um, just like dandelions weren't here, just like honeybees weren't here, uh, they were brought from Europe. And the earthworms is the one that really throws people because you would think, I mean, how far can an earthworm move in a few hundred years? Or how'd they get here in the first place? I mean, you can see flies getting here aboard a ship, uh, which they did from Asia, um, but earthworms, came through ballast. 
you need something to weight ships for when they don't have cargo and they would just shovel dirt in sometimes and of course they're going to get earthworms and they're going to when they get here between you know shipwrecks and unloading and things like that they got here and there were places from the last ice age that had stripped the ground down to new york state and further um, of earthworms um, because it just uh, those glaciers scraped the topsoil bare and um a lot of the replacements had come over on on ships from europe and i opened the chapter on uh the housefly with a poem from my favorite of the japanese haiku masters isa and he was kind of the saint francis of uh, the japanese haiku poets and haiku of course is the little uh, five syllable seven syllable five syllable three line poems no just the image no poetic tricks just a little aha moment draw from, drawn from nature and as you can tell i i like those a lot but his on the house fly was just don't swat the fly. He wrings his hands, he wrings his feet, um, basically implying that the little guy is worrying or praying or something as anybody who's watched them has seen them do, you watch them closely. And if you haven't watched them closely, um, it, do it. I mean, before you chase them out of the house or swat them or whatever you do, um, appreciate them because they, like everything else, had to adapt, had to figure out a way to um, uh, to survive. And what they're actually doing is cleaning themselves the way a cat does. I mean, they uh, they they will go, as we all know, from dog do to your salad and everything in between. They will land on and eat. They taste with their feet, and so they get dirty, and they know that. And so they sit there and they, you know, wring their hands, they run them through their mouths to, um, uh, to get the schmutz off. And um, that's like I say, like a cat. And it doesn't, that's not going to make them clean enough where you need to worry about them less because they do carry all kinds of uh, disease and stuff. So you don't want them uh, any more than you need around you, but they're fascinating the way earthworms are. And I wanted a book that, uh, that celebrated all of them, that um, let us realize what kind of magic there is around us on this pretty little planet. I mean, just that we share uh, the, the air that we breathe and the water that we bathe in with so many creatures who have adapted to us in so many fascinating ways. And um, the... Uh, and so the experts that I drew on, uh, originally, of course, they, was all, they were all from South Carolina, from Clemson and from the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources and biologists and, and um, uh, park rangers and people who spend their days trying both to keep us from harming those creatures and to provide the best habitats and protection they can for them. And these are people on the front lines of um, the relationship that we have with this planet we few species have ever changed this planet from the you know with the possible exception of the the first ones that actually put oxygen into the atmosphere uh, like we have uh, and there's a responsibility that goes with being a wildlife watcher just as there's a responsibility that goes with um, being a bird watcher and having feeders in the yard to know not only which kinds of food attract which kinds of birds and how do I best watch them? Um, and, you know, can I help them nest? Can I put up nesting boxes? Are, are there things to grow to, to encourage butterflies to come through the yard? And, and with that comes the additional responsibility of knowing, hey, birds transmit diseases. And I need to know how often to, to wash and scrub uh, the feeders so that um, illnesses that are common to um, birds like that don't get passed along any more than they have to be. And all of that is, uh, I think, a part of being a responsible wildlife watcher. This book opens uh, with a common crow and it all, it, it goes back to the fact that we raised chickens for about 20 years. You know, we had chicken coops in the backyard and um, the hens uh, who laid eggs had a lifetime health plan. 
they were doted on they um they had a pretty good deal here and um roosters not so much um you, you only want so many roosters and when you have 11 there's gotta, you gotta do something and so um but once i once we had chickens i would listen i'd be in my study writing something and i'd hear the chickens fuss and i got to be able to tell the difference between um hey i just laid an egg uh, that is its own kind of uh, cackle that a hen has i got to learn that from hey the kelly's cat is out and we're scared to death and or, or there's a hawk and the biggest pandemonium came when there was a fox in the yard um yeah and i just from listening i could tell and so in listening to them i started listening to the crows and blue jays which are the most dramatic of the birds around sonically they're the ones that you want to listen to to figure out what's going on out there uh, the blue jays and crows will both swarm birds they don't like like hawks and like owls uh, animals that will carry off nestlings will you know eat eggs disrupt nests they will drive them off and so that helped me to get the sonic part uh, of this into my heart and head and i had to share the tale roger tory peterson who came up with the peterson field guides one of the giants of uh, conservation of ornithology uh, was once uh, visiting friends somewhere uh, in new england and it was out in the country and the friends decided they wanted to go out and um do a bird uh, con competition see who can come up with the most species of birds go out and um see what you can spot and they're going to go out for say two hours. And Peterson said, I don't feel that well. I'm going to stay here. And he was in the bedroom. It was warm enough that the uh, uh, window was open. And they came back and one said I had 36 species and one said I had, you know, 29. And um, he had 42 um, because he knew from listening what was out there. Just from listening through the bedroom window, he knew about more species that that were in the vicinity than his friends who had been out with their binoculars uh, did. And I always thought that was an impressive um, tale of, of the outdoors and of appreciating it. And so there are a couple of uh, pieces in here I'd like to share um, a little something of. And the first goes back to when I first started dating Debbie. Um, this is a chapter on the ruby-throated hummingbird sit here on the porch debbie said one sunday afternoon in early summer i want to show you my hummingbirds we had just started dating and i had come to visit her at her little wife's house in the country she picked up something that looked like an hourglass with several tiny red saxophones sticking out the bottom i soon learned it was a hummingbird feeder but my knowledge of flora fauna and their associated hardware was so rudimentary at the time that i had no idea she walked a few paces into the yard and stood holding the gadget about a foot in front of her face, which wore a look of determined expectation. She stood this way for several minutes, her arm crooked at a 45 degree angle, until I began to believe the hummingbirds might be imaginary and that I should think about tiptoeing toward my car. Soon though, something that sounded like a tiny atomic cat purring zipped across my field of vision. It stopped a few feet from her in the feeder hanging in midair like a battery operated Christmas ornament. Its body angled kind of like the Concord. It eyed her, eyed the feeder and moved in for a drink. Debbie lit up like she'd just been named Miss America. And I have to admit, I was pretty impressed too. The thing had a black throat, or at least it looked black until the sun caught it just right when it glowed like bright red coals. Its back was a nearly as pretty iridescent green. It was feeding inches from Debbie's face. Soon it was joined by another, this one with a white throat, which moved in for its own drink. They buzzed back and forth, drinking for a bit, zipping off to the edge of the woods, then coming back for about 10 minutes until Debbie's arm finally gave out. She came back to me and smiled. Pretty good, huh? She said, it was, it really was. She called them Dipper and Zippy, and they became part of Birding 101, which I took concurrently with Debbie 101. After a while, I learned to love all three of them, and she and I and the hummingbirds' descendants, along with the occasional dog, cat, horse, and chickens, have lived in and around that little white house in the country ever since, and I write about all of them now and then. Um, that scored me a lot of points here. 
um and again this this book is as close to my um heart as uh, uh as anything i've done second place has to be the one about the world war ii female pilots i the only time in my life i ever did the macarena was at the anaheim hilton uh at a convention of wafs and wasp who were the the women who flew during world war ii for the united states military uh and i did it with a um woman who was 75 at the time, her name was Florine Miller Watson. And they called her fly paper during the war because the fly boys all seemed to want to stick to her. And um, it, it was just uh, so much fun interviewing uh, those women. So anyway, that was the second closest to my heart. All right, all right, here's one on the wolf spider. When it comes to mating rituals, being male is a high wire act. In most species, the male is balanced precariously between glory and humiliation, full of concentrated energy, trying desperately to please the target female. To that end, he's strutting, spreading his feathers, throwing dirt with his antlers, bringing nesting materials, singing, croaking, or roaring, showing off his plumage, voice, size, or coat. And as any male who's been single in the past 30 years can tell you, it's no picnic. Still, perspective is everything. Sure, we can have our ego shattered and our hopes dashed. She can snarl, claw, bellow, nip, or just plain run us off. She can have another suitor waiting in the wings to charge at us. But think of the cruelest put down you've ever heard, a response to the worst fumbling and bumbling by a would-be bow that suitordom has ever produced. Chances are the female didn't kill and eat him. That's something you can't always count on if you're a wolf spider. Here, the male has to do a spider break dance, impressive enough that at the very least, he doesn't become dinner after the floor show. If he can get her to cozy up to him, so much the better. Each species, says William Shear, biologist emeritus at Virginia's Hampton Sydney College, has a characteristic set of movements the males use in courtship, usually involving leg-like mouth parts called pedipalps and the first pair of legs. Often, these appendages have black spots or patches of hairs that make them look larger and more obvious. Some species also have sound producing scrapers between the joints of the pedipalps and transmit vibrations to the ground or to a leaf as part of their courtship. Whether or not he is providing his own sonic accompaniment, he had better be good. The courtship, adds Dr. Shear, allows the female to be sure she is hooking up with a male of her own species. The ritual turns off the predatory instinct. So if the male does not do it exactly right, he gets treated like any other prey item. This would take you out of the dating pool with, as they say, extreme prejudice. Um, let's see, and one more. And, and choosing these, choosing the 36 that uh, uh, appear in the book was a matter both of um, those that really uh, tickled me that I really wanted to share um, first out in, in the first of what I hope will be a series of these. Um, and then places where I felt like I understand, uh, understood the critter well enough to, um, um, to do a good job in, in getting it across, to start the conversation um, with those who were um, interested enough to read. And one more, the Eastern Cottontail Rabbit. You've got to hand it to the rabbit. Few creatures have cut a wider swath through literature and culture than this meek, furry symbol of the reproductive arts. That connection has given us both the Easter Bunny and the Playboy Bunny. And the scope of the creature's wider influence can be seen in just a short list of its representatives in the culture. Thumper and Bugs, Br'er, Roger and Peter Rabbit, Alice in Wonderland's White Rabbit and Jefferson Airplane's psychedelic nod to it, the Velveteen Rabbit, Captain Kangaroo's Bunny Rabbit and the Hare, different genus, same family, who gets smoked by the tortoise. What's not to love, right? Rabbits are docile, they're soft, and they have floppy ears and cottony tails. As an added bonus, they taste good. Despite all that, rabbits have been known to stir negative emotions ranging from mild to homicidal. Ask any gardener. Better yet, ask the Aussies. Australia, whose evolutionary path branched off pretty early from the rest of the world, has provided us with a quintessential be careful what you let loose story, and it involves the lowly rabbit. In 1859, the year Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species, an Australian farmer named Thomas Austin released 24 European rabbits on his property in Southern Victoria as something to hunt. The rabbits reproduce like, well, like rabbits. 
and nothing had ever evolved on the continent to eat them. So there was no natural check on their population growth. Within 10 years, hunters were taking 2 million rabbits a year without noticeably affecting their overall numbers. Meanwhile, the rabbits stripped vegetation to the extent that an undetermined number of plant species and some of the animals that fed on them went extinct. Um, almost every place I turned in this book, there was something fascinating to learn. There was, uh, there was um, an interaction between humans and the species or just interaction between the species themselves that, that really grabbed me, uh, grabbed the poet in me and grabbed the storyteller in me. And I tried to choose three that, uh, uh, that, that showed that here. Um, there are a couple of things I, I wanna mention about the process of doing this. In, in all the years that I've done these kinds of stories, I'm always impressed with the biologists and the people who work for the state agencies. They're not paid a lot of money. And they have vitally important jobs when you look at the history of the planet. I mean, this is, as I said, the people who are on the front lines of our interactions, who study habitat, who knows what it takes, you know, who knows why, for instance, mockingbirds and robins are more plentiful now than they were when Europeans landed on the continent, or why so many other creatures um, aren't. I mean, buffalo roamed in, in South Carolina uh, as did wolves and a lot of other creatures um, when we got here and they don't anymore and you know the reason one of the reasons there are so many deer car collisions is, is that there aren't natural predators anymore um, and you know coyotes are moving in to take over some of what the wolf had done but they compete with foxes and they kill foxes and it helps to have people who study this and just know how to to inform us about what we can do to be um, better stewards if that's the word um, and it all begins with being an observer it begins with having literate conversations um, you know through reading and through groups and through getting out into the uh, wilderness with uh, binoculars but i'm more of a let's all start in the yard let's put up a bird feeder let's study how to keep it clean and all that sort of thing and let's watch what comes through most of us would be surprised you know with just a little trail camera uh in the yard what is still around um that's what proved to me that foxes were still around in our neighborhood when we got here 30 some years ago um there were still whippoorwills there were still um uh, quail bob white quail there aren't any more, but there are still foxes, there are still turkeys, there's still a lot of things that you like seeing around. And we try to have a yard that is a little rough around the edges because we know that so many creatures benefit uh, with extra things to eat, extra places to hide when we let the weeds have another, you know, another row or two that I'm not mowing. I, I don't mind that at all. We, we have, uh, both woods and fields nearby. So we have a pretty good mix of habitat. There are water sources. And, um, and that's another thing to keep water out for uh, animals um, and to really watch them. And, and again, to watch everything from the spiders um, to know which ones you know, can bite and hurt you uh, and which ones can't. And to appreciate snakes, to know that um, not every th snake out there is a copperhead and you know it's not our business to be killing off snakes we have moved into their habitat and to have you know more respect to know when there's danger and when there's not is kind of um our responsibility in the long run we want to be able to pass along um, nature as interesting and as vast as we can to the generations that follow us. Um, even those who are my age uh, grew up in a far different time than we have now. And I'm hoping that this book can replace for some kids, for some you know, parent or grandparents' kids who's listening into some of these, uh, can replace some time on an electronic device. Um, those things are educational and have their purpose, but we have 
let them far exceed their usefulness. Um, and I remember just reading, you know, Boy's Life or Pennsylvania Game News growing up and just getting away in my head with the stories that people were telling. And I really hope that this book um, contributes a little, little bit to that, that we can have a uh, discussion. And I'm gonna invite Joe back on here to see if we can open a discussion with you good people who have been patiently um, uh, waiting and I appreciate it. Excellent, thank you so much, Rob. So we do have a few questions that have popped up in the Q&A section and don't forget, if you would like to ask a question, just feel free to type it in right there. So the first one um, this evening is from Charlene and she asks, how did Debbie come by her amazing knowledge of birds, nature, and the like? Um, a great question. Um, thanks, Charlene. Uh, um, Debbie grew up, uh, spent her first six or seven years uh, on the family home place in northern Alabama. I mean, I'm talking outhouse. I'm talking mule-drawn plow, um, country girl, country girl. Um, mother of great lard cook, and um, uh, they all fished. They could prepare any kind of food. They had huge gardens, and she loved, you know, being the little barefoot five-year-old out learning what that nest was and things like that. And they moved to Nashville um, during the school year when she hit first grade, but they kept the home place and spent their summers there. And she had taken a man named Michael Byerly, who a great uh, birder in Tennessee, legendary birder. And she would go birding with him. Uh, he would take groups out. And so she honed her skills that way. And by the time I met her, like I said, she knew if it was there, she knew what it was. And if the grid goes down, I'm sticking with her because we will eat just fine. Um, even if there are no grocery stores, and when we run out of canned goods, she will know what in the woods will keep us going. Excellent. Thank you so very much. So the next question comes from Robert, and he asks, what impact has climate change had on some of the animals you discuss in the book, and what about the future? Um, every so many lines are are moving north the northern extension of the the natural habitat of so many birds and insects um, is moving north simply because places farther north stay warmer uh, longer and the seasons there are many nesting seasons that are starting earlier right now and um, and that's going to continue as a kid uh, in in, in northern Pennsylvania, uh, in the mountains, I remember years where there was snow on the ground from Halloween till Easter, um, straight through. And you'd go, there were times you could go a month at a time and not get above freezing. That doesn't happen uh, anymore. The, the snows are later. And so, and it's like that, you know, we have gotten a, a couple of nice cold snaps uh, this year, but still there are places in um, Europe and Asia that are decidedly warmer than we have been. And in the long run, things like ocean acidification, if we don't stop over harvesting uh, the fish in the ocean, and if we don't find a way to uh, stop ocean acidification, we are in huge trouble. Um, the notion that we um, are too small to affect the planet's uh, climate is a silly notion. Uh, we can, and we have, and we will, and we owe it to ourselves to be as educated as we can and to talk to those who make laws and um, try to have an impact going forward. And that's, whenever we start to be better wildlife watchers, we read more and expand our knowledge because there are there are people who will argue most sides of both sides of most things and it's up to us to find the people who really are in the trenches who can help us understand both how something like climate change happens and how it affects us so thank you robert for the question and to follow up a little bit on that and and something that you read about 
um, you know, it seems that, um, you know, the South and the Southern coastal region are very rich in biodiversity. And, you know, we have like the Southern right whale, and, you know, we have certain species that, that maybe other regions don't. Um, you know, in fact, I live three miles from Stone Mountain here in Georgia, and, you know, it, it's quite famous that those little poles on the top of Stone Mountain and Arabia Mountain have lichens and, and, and little microbes in it that don't exist anywhere else other than on the top of Stone Mountain. So when you look at, at regionality, um, you know, is there a, um, you know, a greater groundswell of people who recognize the uniqueness of say like those little areas on Arabia Mountain and Stone Mountain that have these certain things and are trying to preserve them. And that, you know, maybe ripples out you know, farther uh, for conservation efforts. And then, you know, thinking about that as well as the, you know, how you mentioned um, invasive species. Um, you know, as a homeowner, it seems that I have fought English ivy this entire spring and summer in my yard. Um, and, you know, while that's not <laughs> the same, um, it is the bane of my existence. Um, but, you know, when you see things on the news, like these large snails that have been introduced, um, sort of like into, into Florida and things like that, um, you know, are there, you know, do we still have, you know, mechanisms to combat that? You know, how, how vigilant are, um, are we in trying to keep these invasive species at bay as sort of, you know, borders come down due to shipping and, 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 and you know, freight lines and airlines and things like that. There are the, the biodiversity first, the Southeast is so rich. There are, there are crustaceans, there are uh, cave um, fish and salamanders and, and all kinds of uh, um, crayfish and things that, that no place else has. There are so many species in, uh, um, in, in the Smokies and throughout the Southeast. And it is rich for invasives. And um, there are battles that we've pretty much lost like the zebra mussel, which will go through and outcompete um, most everything. And there are those, uh, uh, the jumping fish that whose name is gonna escape me right now. Um, and, and then there are the, um, the snakes in the Everglades, and speaking of global warming, they'll eventually be as far north as Washington D.C. if we don't do something, um, and and move throughout the uh, uh, the southeast. Uh, the and the thing to do there is again, it's education, it's appreciating what we've got, and separating the fact that if I'm going to plant a tree, I want to plant a tree that's native. Um, some of the pretty early bloomers in, in the spring that you see around here are. Um, non-native invasive species that that we don't want, and some of the um, uh, animals that can come through. I mean, the the starling was introduced by a gentleman. I think it was in the 1870s who wanted to assure himself that every bird that Shakespeare mentioned uh, lived in the in North America. So he brought some starlings to Central Park. And the first couple of times you try it, they, they died out, but eventually he brought, I think, 14 or something. And here we are. We've got, they're probably the most common bird in, in North America. And um, so it's up to us with the education again and with supporting legislators don't care much about the outdoors. And there are so many people who fish and hunt in, in legislators, but um, I mean, they just don't. And we need to hold their feet to the fire to say, look, as a, as a society, we value the diversity of plants and animals that we have, and let's take common sense measures um, to try to protect them as best we can. And there are groups, most any state or county will have a group that goes out in the spring and say, you know, pulls up certain invasive species to give others a chance among the wildflowers and things like that. And there, you know, kudzu being one of the most egregious examples. And that was brought here from Japan for one of the world's fairs, I think in Philadelphia, about 150 years ago. And, um, you know, that this is going to be good for soil erosion, they said. And, you know, we can, you know, it eats houses, it eats cars, it eats hills. 
And, um, and so again, for all of us to educate ourselves and to do what we can just on a small scale to keep, to, to plant, if I'm gonna have a garden, I may as well plant things that local butterflies uh, will find to their advantage that they lay eggs on um, rather than something that they don't. Excellent, that's actually a, a good segue into the next two questions. Um, they're are kind of related to, to tips and tricks. Um, the first is, you know, Suzanne, she asks what happened to the whippoorwills? Um, that she remembers them too, and they were very loud in Greenwood at night. And Anderson asks, what recommendations do you have for bird or other animal feeders and houses to encourage the presence of wildlife in your backyard? Ah, um, I'll take the second one first. Um, I believe in a great mix of um, feeders. We've got a bunch. And the trick is not to have too many too close so that the birds are all congregating together all the time. Because if something starts, and if you've ever seen conjunctivitis in birds, it will blind them. It's not, it's not, once you see it, you will redouble your efforts to, um, uh, to bleach your feeder, you know, every now and then and to, uh, to change out the hummingbird water every couple of days uh, in the summer when it's really hot. But, you know, a, a good hummingbird feeder, which uh, some of the woodpeckers will also come to, um, a suet feeder, um, black oil sunflower seed will attract probably the widest variety of birds. Um, and there are other mixes that you can get, but those are, are uh, the basics. And um, leaving water out um, is an, another, especially if you can get just a little fountain that bubbles a little bit and you know there's a sound to it, um, will attract other species. And what was the first uh, of those two questions? The, well, asking um, about the whippoorwills, what happened to oh, the whippoorwills? Whip yeah, whippoorwills as ground nesting birds and same with quail. Um, everything goes after them. And here's um, some animal lovers don't like this part of it, but if you have an outdoor cat, you are killing hundreds of birds a year. That's just a fact. Um, I don't care, you know, whether they proudly bring home a mouse now and then they're killing birds left and right. And we don't want that. Um, and dogs that run loose will tear up ground nests. And then of course you've got coyotes and you've got other birds and the natural predators that they have already, raccoons and things. But as society, as suburbs encroach on um, farmland, um, just the, the mix of what's there uh, changes. And, you know, uh, people letting their dogs and cats run loose are probably the biggest single reason that we don't have whippoorwills. Uh, you have to go farther and farther out into the country. And um, yeah, that's sad, but true. Yeah, so well, thank you for that. So just as a reminder, if anyone wants to ask some questions before we wrap up this evening, feel free to type them in the Q&A and we will answer those live. Um, so we have um, two questions. I'm gonna combine them both because um, they just seem thematically linked, is that how old were you when you knew that you wanted to be a naturalist? And are there one or two books that really influenced your nature writing? Oh my goodness, uh, nature writing, uh, the field guides. Um, uh, David Sibley um, is doing great work and he, he's kind of the natural um, successor to Roger Torrey Peterson, who I was fortunate enough to, um, I, I uh, corresponded with him. I've got a letter from uh, Roger here, or a couple of them, and a signed um, uh, Eastern field guide, uh, one of my prized possessions. Um, I knew as a youngster I wanted to be a writer. I was 11 when I figured out I wanted to be a writer. Um, but a nature writer, really, it comes with Debbie, and I was in my early 30s uh, when that happened. And I just, there is a sense of adventure that goes with writing about the outdoors that, you know, I don't get writing about a lot of things. I mean, there's more adventure to, to that than the years I've done writing music business stuff. Um, I've, I've been really fortunate in the music business, I've worked with everybody from Whalen and Kenny Rogers to, um, you know, Carrie Underwood and um, Brad Paisley and Blake Shelton. And um, 
uh, and that's it's been a big overlap. I mean, part of th this book has endorsement quotes from the late Charlie Daniels and uh, from uh, let's see who we've got here, uh, Kix Brooks, um, uh, Leon Womack, Craig Morgan, and just the country music business overlaps a lot with people uh, in the outdoors. And you're talking before about people who, you know, come to appreciate. There's a big overlap between you know, people who people who hunt are out in nature, and they are easily um, uh, among the most aware people of what's out there. And you know, there's the consumptive part of, of what they do. And I'm not going to get into the argument about what's good or bad about it, but they are often, you know, hunters almost hunted turkeys to extinction. Hunters brought them back. Uh, same with ducks. There's a lot more intelligence that goes into how we look at uh, animals that some people use for food than there, there has been. And that's, you know, a great um, sign in itself. Actually, speaking of that, um, you know, just off the top of your head, you know, what are maybe, you know, two, three species that are here in the South that maybe we need to keep our eye on, that, that we should be aware of, that they're, um, you know, endangered or uh, species are encroaching on their habitat that, that we should be aware of as Southerners? Uh, the red cockaded woodpecker is is one of the classic stories. It, um, it, it requires a specific kind of very old pine, and there are just aren't very many places. There's there's some in Arkansas, there's uh, some in South Carolina, maybe one or two other places. But um, I mean, I've seen them. Um, I've made it a point to go where they are, but they they need again a very specific uh, kind of tree, um, and things like you. I mentioned before in in uh, monarch butterflies, which I mean they're they're more northern, but they pass through here. And there, I talk in the book about the fact there's a small winter population in South Carolina, um, as well as uh, Florida. But they, um, the fact that we use so many pesticides, and there's so much monoculture in the way we grow food, that it's taken away. Um, the plants that they normally use as food and to lay eggs. And, you know, so monarchs have gone, their population has dwindled dramatically in the past 20 or 30 years. And we didn't know until the 1970s where they spent the winter, uh, which is in a small patch of land in the mountains of Mexico. And um, there's a chapter on them in here that, uh, that, you know, just talks about the challenges they face. And again, how we can um, study up and plant things that will encourage them to, uh, you know, to, to just help them survive. Excellent. Thank you so much. I, I know personally, uh, one of the, you know, nice benefits of being a homeowner um, is that, you know, when everything is sort of like in bloom and in the spring and the summer and I go out and there's butterflies and you get excited nowadays when there's, you know, several butterflies on your azaleas or, or um, you know, on the, the like Shasta daisies out in the yard that I don't think we were that had that same excitement when we were kids because there just seemed to be butterflies around and there seemed to be yeah. bees around and, and, and um, you know, it was more of, you know, not running around in the backyard barefoot because you were going to probably get stung by a bee. And, and you know, now it's an uncommon occurrence to see, especially like the large bumblebees on hydrangeas and things like that out in the yard. Yeah, and honeybees have been in, in big trouble for quite a while. And there's a mite that um, has given them uh, a problem and we've got to watch. We're always excited when we see, we had a pretty good uh, crop of hummingbirds this year because of the, the way we let the wildflowers um, go around here. But there've been years when we haven't seen many at all. And we need honeybees, we just do. I actually, and that's a, another great question too, you know, off the top of your head, you know, what, what maybe two or three plants can we put in our yards um, that, you know, will probably be aesthetically pleasing to, you know, the fine Southern gardener, but that will be beneficial to honeybees and butterflies? Uh, 
milkweed for um, monarch butterflies, uh, for sure. And most of the native uh, wildflowers will draw um, honeybees, as will just clover. Um, we, I'm a big fan of grass that's a little messy and mixed in with, you know, the um, the clovers and things. People want that that straight, tall, beautiful grass in the suburbs, and they put all kind of poisons on it to make that happen, and just to let it go more naturally. And if you can, uh, to leave the leaves that fall from trees on the ground through the winter, um, or at the very least, to to mulch them. There are insects and there are um, butterflies that and moths that will have eggs on the leaves that fall. And for us to leave them gives them a chance to make it through the winter and emerge next spring. And you know, there, I understand there are places and neighborhoods where you, it just doesn't make sense to do that. But if you can spare your backyard and let the leaves lie there, you are doing a whole lot of critters uh, a big favor. I, I have to say, I am a, I am a mulcher. So I mulch the front yard and I, you know, the backyard is the backyard and it, it stays leaf covered. Um, mm -hmm. I also live in a very, very forested neighborhood. So it also takes quite a bit to remove the large amount of leaves that fall from my trees every year. I spend um, most of October sweeping my deck from, from the maple leaves that fall uh, all the time. It, it 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 never fails um you know i'll go and i'll do the curb so it looks nice and things like that and you know i'll say give it an hour and you know i give it an hour and it's it's as if i did absolutely no work but you know the the price of living in a city within a forest here in atlanta so we just have to have to deal with those little problems i'll put up so with we, most of what nature gives me just for the, the chance to be in it and enjoy it Absolutely. Let me see, we have something that popped up. Up oh, here we go. And actually that's going to be the next question before we close this evening. And that is, so what's next for you? What are you working on next? Uh, I, am, I am actually, since I retired from radio, um, there I'm collecting, I wrote about crime for quite a bit in Nashville for the Nashville scene, which is our free weekly over here. And I've collected that and I wanna see if I can't get that published. Uh, and I've I had a friend, uh, a terrific poet who died young, and I'm collecting her work, and I'm going to put that together. And I will be talking to um, uh, USC Press about a volume two of, of this. I've, we've got more to, to go here, more stories to tell. Excellent. Well, we look forward to that book and the other books in the future as well. Don't forget, everyone, if you like to order a copy, um, the link is in the chat, um, but Eagle Eye Books is our bookseller this evening, and of course, they will take orders by phone. Um, I believe they're doing curbside pickup. If you order it and would like to pick it up at their store here in Decatur, they will happily do that for you. Rock, thank you so very much for joining us evening. Thank you all for allowing us to come into your homes. Thank you, Reed SC and the South Carolina Center for the Book and Anderson Cook for helping us to coordinate this event. Please look for more of these in the future with the great talent pool that we have in Georgia and South Carolina. I am sure we will keep you entertained and well-read for many, many years to come with this series. Once again, thank you all so very much for joining us and we will see you again very, very soon. Thank have you, good Thank you, everybody.